How many of you were here on Sunday morning? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so that there was a message. Pastor shared a little bit, then he showed a message from Jeremy Pearsons. And we're going to do a little spinoff of that tonight. It was, it was really good, and I think it was really necessary. I mean, here's the deal. When, when things get taught at the church that God's called you to, the timing is for right then, right? So it's perfect for you. It's perfect for me. And so we may as well just stay here for a minute and get some more out of it. You want to? So on top of that, it's really just going to be the reason I said it's going to be kind of look like, you know, teaching through Bible school is I just went back through my notes. We will be talking about faith tonight. Faith. And uh, I just typed faith in my little notebook, my search thing, and it took me all day. This was my study today, going through notes. There's a lot of notes on faith, right? And so we're going to kind of get a smorgasbord of things on faith, but we're going to put it together, and there's going to be a focus for us tonight. And I want to open up to where, let me get my notes out, to where uh, Jeremy Pearson's in that video talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we are going to uh, stay in verse 17 and 18. So if you got your Bibles, you're going to want to kind of keep your thumb there because we're going to be going back there a lot. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. All right. It says, I'm going to be reading out of the NLT. So, Adam, get ready to go back and forth to this verse. We're going to pop in and out. It says, uh, for our personal or our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Let's, let's just stop right there. How many of you feel like your present troubles are small? And not lasting very long. That's right, because we're not liars. We're not raising our hand, right? Isn't it funny how we don't ever really feel like our present troubles are small or lasting just a short time? When we're experiencing troubles and issues in our life, it's the biggest thing in the world, and it's lasting forever, right? This is, this is how we feel. And we know that that's not true. The Bible says, hey, um, there's no temptation that is, that's fallen on you, but such as is common to man. What's happening to you is happening to your brothers and sisters throughout the world. The devil likes to try to isolate us in these instances and say, no one has it as bad as you. No one's going through what you're going through. In fact, the people who have gone through this haven't gone through it like you have. It's specifically bad for you. And what he's trying to get you to do, you know what that causes you to do? Where does that cause your focus to go? inward. And there's no hope there. And there's no hope there. Um, but here's what Paul says. Our present troubles, this is Paul. He's talking about his and, and the, the team that he's with. Their present troubles are small and won't last very long. And we're going to talk about their present troubles. Just to give you a little hint, their present troubles, he said, uh, they are constantly living in danger of death. So, when we talk about small problems and not lasting very long, living in danger of death seems like a big problem, and he says it's constant. So, uh, the, Paul, this is what Paul's saying. Now, but here's the deal. We're not to compare our troubles to what Paul's troubles are or to what other people's troubles are, okay? But, so, this isn't one of these where, where Paul's admonishing us, hey, suck it up, buttercup. I'm, I'm avoiding, I'm escaping death every single day. You can get through whatever you're getting through. That's not, that's not what's being said here. We're not to compare what we're going through to what others are going through. Here's what it needs to bring to us, though. It needs to bring to us a sense of perspective. Perspective is huge, and it's everything. And I've used this example before, and I'm going to do it again, even though you may know it, because it's effective. And I just found this upstairs, and I hope it works. Hey, can, can you guys help me? Can you all... Jake, Ben, can y'all run this? I hope there's enough there. Let's just run it through that door and then through this door over here, okay? It's red like the blood of Jesus. That was on purpose. And then we have, we were washed as white as snow, so I've got a white one. See how I did that? Tie it together, yeah. This represents eternity, and sometimes, you know, that's what this is. That represents the time in eternity when the Razorbacks won the national title. It was a blip. It doesn't happen very often, and there we go. Okay, so this, this represents eternity. 
And it's still going. And for all you know, that thing is not ending because this is eternity, okay? Ben, can you take that outside? Or just hide it to where people think that they can't see the end of it. I love it. Awesome. Look, this, this, this right here, this represents eternity. You can't see where it began, and you can't see where it ends. And, and this is the perspective that, that's hard to have, and the more that you think about it, um, the more that it can kind of blow your mind the deeper you get into it. But this is the type of perspective we need to have. Here's a sticky note. Here, here is, here's you. That's you right there. Ben, ben you can come in, man. I, ben, can you hear me? You can come in. Yeah, you're good. You, just leave it there. Just, just, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Jay. Y'all can, yeah, thank y'all. Man. No, no, no. It's, it's, it doesn't end. Yeah. Sorry, I should. They could have been out there all service, y'all. So you can, you can see this here. This is your life right here, this little post-it note. And this is, this is an important perspective for us to have. This isn't to say that, that our lives are small and meaningless and pointless. In fact, we're going to read something so amazing uh, just in view of this right here. But what, but what we do know is that our present troubles, this is the span of our life right here. And at this very moment in time, in the middle of this post-it note, wherever you're at in life, you're going through something, your present troubles, they're small and they won't last very long because I'm viewing them in scope of this right here. And you, and you say, yeah, that's really cool. How does that help me right now? If we don't have this perspective first, we cannot get help right now. And we're going to find out why. He says, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Somebody say, last forever. What I love about this is that what he's saying is that my present troubles, the little, the little speck on this little post-it note right now, what I'm going through, I'm in constant danger of death. But those are so small, but they are going to produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs what we're going through right now, and that glory will last forever. This is amazing. What I'm going through right now, this little part right here, how I handle where I'm at right now and what I'm doing can affect the rest of this line right here for the rest of eternity. How I handle right here, right now, in year 38 of my life in the scope of eternity. And Paul, and Paul said, what I'm going through, it's nothing, it's not lasting long, it's going to produce for us a glory that's going to outweigh so vastly what we're going through, and it'll last forever. Next verse. Um, no, wait, not next verse yet. So, I want, I want to show you, we're going to go back to uh, verses 8 through 16. And we're going to read what Paul was going through. This is why Paul could say that. This is why Paul could say that their troubles were producing a weighty glory for them that would last forever. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach. Here's why it is. Because what Paul's doing, he's doing the work of God. He is doing what God called him to do for his life. And because of that, he is, he is suffering persecution, he is in trouble, he is in constant danger of death. But he said something very important. He says, but we continue to preach. I continue to do what I'm supposed to do, and because I'm doing what God has called me to do, in the face of persecution, trials, tribulations, trouble that pops up, because I'm doing that, I know that these troubles, I'm going to receive a glory that lasts forever that far outweighs what I'm going through right now. 
That, do, that doesn't just happen just because you cross that threshold of eternity where this post-it note ends. That's not automatic. It's not automatic. How I'm handling what I'm doing right here and now. In fact, I want to read this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. It says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. We're all going to stand there. Sometimes we don't talk about this as much because, like, man, once I made Jesus the Lord of my life, we're all Christians. We're all on a boat together. We're all going to cross over. We all made it. But we're not all equal. We're not all equal, and we're not all going to be rewarded the same. The judgment seat of Christ for you and I, it's actually translated the reward seat of Christ. And he will be handing out rewards based on how we handled this post-it note right here. So as big as the problems that I feel like I'm facing right now, as big as those may seem, how I handle them, how I approach them right now, it is going to matter for the rest of eternity how I'm living. Amen. So this is how Paul knew that their current troubles were going to produce a glory that vastly outweighs them forever because of how they responded to those troubles. All right, so let's go back to 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, we'll read verse 18 now. I love this. It says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Look at your neighbor and say, don't look. Look at your other neighbor and say, don't look. That's the title of tonight's message. Don't look. All right, now let's look at, um, tell your other neighbor, say, now we can look at something. All right. Well, I do love the simplicity of this verse. So Paul's saying, uh, he, he's saying our, our present troubles are small. They won't last very long. Uh, he says, so we don't look at those. Don't you love how simple that sounds? Yeah, we've got a lot of bad things going on. Uh, we're at the point of almost dying every day, but we're not really looking at that. So just, just don't look at that. Don't you love how simple that sounds? Uh, the Greek word here, look, means to kind of look at, to observe, to contemplate, to consider, right? Uh, so, so it's what we're considering. It's what we're contemplating. And um, you, you might think that uh, th this, isn't, this isn't some type of theology that says to ignore the problems going on in your life. That's not what we're talking about. Because you might think that this sounds irresponsible. Uh, this sounds, I mean, frankly, impossible. How can I just ignore what's going on? That's not what we're doing because there's an important word uh, in, in verse 18 here. Um, it says, rather. Some translations say, but. Rathers and buts are big, important words. Rather, but what we do is we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. We fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Um, I love uh, what Jeremy Pearson's, I don't know if he said this in the message that we listened to on Sunday or it's just a note that I wrote down because of how I heard it. But he said, magnifying what's wrong with me has never served to fix what's wrong with me. But magnifying what's right in me will serve to fix what's wrong in me. Let me say it again. Magnifying, or say it like this, magnifying the problems in your life, magnifying your current situation, as bad and as grim as it may be, will not serve to solve that problem. It won't serve you. Having your focus there will not serve you. Let's talk about what will, shall we? So here's the truth. The truth is, how many of you want to hear the truth? Say, give me the truth. Give me the, I'm going to give you the truth. Here's the truth. This is the truth I talk about with my kids all the time. The truth is, is that it all boils down to what I choose, what I will. And so we may think, how can I not look at this thing that consumes my every day for the last three months of what's going on in my life? How can I not look at it? And sometimes it's just too easy and too simple for us to think that it's just a choice. But here's what it is. It's a choice. This is the most important thing you have at your disposal. God made us uh, beings with free will. And so the choice, our choice, is the most powerful thing we have available to us. It's our choice. Nobody can make me choose what I look at. Nobody. 
Kids, the, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil can't make you do anything. Nobody can make you do anything. You get to choose. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Choose. We have a choice. Say, like, I have a choice. I have a choice. And, and it's easy because our flesh wants to magnify the problem. Uh, but like we talked about, that turns us internal and that turns us looking at self. I love what Pastor Bill Johnson said. I saw this a couple places in my notes today. He said, be careful how you identify a problem. Oh, it's so big. Nobody knows how big the problem is that I'm going through. Be careful how we identify a problem and how we talk about a problem. Uh, because sometimes it, it may be that we're just really uh, seeking sympathy from a friend instead of a breakthrough from a person of faith. And this is why I continue to go back to it. Honestly, I thought this message was originally going to be about just the importance of, uh, how, how silly is this going to sound, just the importance of coming to church. That's what I thought this entire message was going to be. And don't you think that's a silly message to preach to a group of people on a Wednesday, who are in church on a Wednesday night? But, but here's the deal. Just because you're in church on a Wednesday night right now doesn't mean that you might not be tempted to not be at church on Wednesday night three years from now. And so this is why the word of God is so important and why coming to church and why coming to the place that God has called you to get his word is so important. I mean, it, it's not just important, guys. It, it's, this, is, this is like your life on the line type of stuff. It's life and death. It's life and death. Okay. Um, let's see here. Say it again. Don't look. Don't look. All right, let's look in Romans chapter 4. We're allowed to look there. Say, look at Romans 4. Okay, Romans 4, verse 18 through 19. This goes with what uh, Pastor Evan was just talking about, that scripture she read about Sarah. So this one's talking about Abraham. And it says, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. Oh, even when there was no reason for hope. Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations, for God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider. Say, did not consider. Did not consider. Same, same word we were looking at earlier, look. He did not look at his own body, already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not consider. He did not look at his own body. And this was another note that I found in my list of notes today. It was in a couple of different Pastor Nate's messages, I think. It says, great faith is measured by what we don't consider. Great faith is measured by what we don't consider. This is faith right here, talking about Abraham. What, what was his faith measured by? By what he didn't look at. What he didn't look at. Sarah's faith in Hebrews that she was talking about, it was by what she didn't look at, what she didn't consider. And the, these are heroes of faith, the Bible tells us. One of, my, one of the, the favorite little pieces of Abraham and Sarah's story that I love when you're reading about these heroes of faith in Romans and 4, talking about how they, they didn't stumble at the promise of God. And I'm like, I, 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 mean, I mean, Paul, I, I read Genesis. Have you read Genesis? I, it feels like they may have stumbled, but the Bible says they didn't stumble. And, and here, this is important for us because Abraham and Sarah, they're just like you and I. They're not perfect. They're not perfect. And they didn't do exactly what God said every step of the way. Guess what they, guess what they didn't do, though? They didn't quit. They did not quit on what God said. They never let go of what God said. And they ended up, guess what, with what God said. So no matter, no matter if we think we miss it, We've messed up, I messed up, and that's why I'm experiencing these troubles, and that's why I'm in the situation I am right now. Hey, hey, that doesn't matter. You take God's promise for what it is, and you will see God's promise fulfilled in your life. Don't quit on it. There's a saying we've had in this church for a long time, if you don't quit, you win. The only people who lose are the ones who quit when we're talking about the things of God. Don't quit. Don't quit. They didn't quit. They didn't quit. So he did not consider his own body. He was looking not to the things which he saw, but the things which are unseen. Uh, let me get, did I finish? Let me finish 2 Corinthians 4, 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. It says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. 
but the things we cannot see, they will last forever. Doesn't this sound like an, an oxymoron? Hey, I want you to look at the things that you can't see. How many of you have read this in the Bible before, before you may have had some understanding and context? I want you to look at the things you can't see. What? Maybe this is why some people think the Bible is confusing or contradicts itself, but the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Uh, the Bible defines itself. The Bible explains itself. The Bible is perfectly clear, right, when we ask the Holy Spirit, the author of the book, to help us understand his word. It's clear. And let's see what they're talking about here. So when we're talking about uh, looking at the things that we can't see, this isn't just talking about um, our eyes, okay? We're talking about all of our physical senses. We're talking about anything that I can ascertain with my physical senses in this natural realm. This is what, he, this is what we're saying, okay? We're, to, we're not to, to look at the things that we can see, we can taste, we can touch, we can hear, we can reason and understand that. That's not, that's not the things that we're talking about right here. He's saying, I want you to look to the things that are unseen. All right, so what are unseen things? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, says, For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. The eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord, it remains forever. So when we're talking about, hey, fix your eyes on the things that are unseen, uh, let's replace that word unseen because we can gather from the context that we're talking about eternal things here. You, we need to fix our eyes on things that are eternal. Eternal. And what do we read from 1 Peter here? What does it say is eternal? The Word of God. This is the only eternal thing that we have at our disposal. And I know that I probably harp on this every time I teach, but it still amazes me that I have the holy inspired Word of God right here in my hand. And in all of my life and everything that I've seen, experienced, tasted, touched, felt, heard, this is the only thing I have at my disposal that's eternal. And it's like it's alive. It's eternal. Like, we all, we all have access to eternal things. That's pretty amazing. So we all have the ability to fix our eyes and fix our gaze on what's eternal, right? Because we have it available to us. Um, Psalms 138, verse 2, says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. Wow, this is, this is, this is awesome here. We ha I have a different NLT than this. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for unfailing love. Are y'all wondering if I'm reading the same translation? I'm reading my NLT. I don't know what's going on here. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. That's not really at all what I just read, so same thing, though. Here, listen to what I read. All right, pull that down real quick. Listen to this. You have exalted above all else your name and your word, and you have magnified your word above all your name. Man, I saw this today, and I'm like, God has magnified his own word above his name. I mean, this is the eternal of eternal. He has magnified this above his name the name of Jesus, the name that's above all names, and yet he's saying, my word, I magnify my word above all my name. You have this. You have it. Thanks. All right, I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians. We're going to go back to 2 Corinthians. Verse 18 was the end of chapter 4. We're going to roll right in to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, and I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. It says, we are convinced that even if these bodies we live in are folded up at death like tents, we will still have a God-built home that no human hands have built, which will last forever in the heavenly realm. We inwardly sigh as we live in these physical tents, longing to put on a new body for our life in heaven, in belief that once we put on our new clothing, we won't find ourselves naked. So while, we're li while living in this tent, we groan under its burden. I think this is something that Jeremy was reading, Pastor Jeremy was reading on Sunday morning, a version of it, because I really related 
to that example he gave of like as his body's getting older and he makes a lot of noises when he sits down and gets up and I'm like, man, I do that. I do that. You know, have you ever just like sit down and you're like, oh, <laughs> dad, what's wrong with you? I, I just sat down. Help me up. <coughs> what happened? There. Um, do y'all make those noises when you sit down and stuff? No? Well, all right. But this is true. Like, this is our bodies. This doesn't mean that our bodies are breaking down, but really, over time, they are. With these natural flesh bodies that we have, uh, they're going to experience death. Like, we're all on our way there. We're all going to die. All right, y'all have a good night. <laughs> I've, always thought, I've always wanted to preach a, a message like that. Like, we're all going to die. Just think about it. All right. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> these natural bodies are, and this is what he's talking about here, we want these new bodies. We crave for all that is mortal to be swallowed up by eternal life. As this is no empty hope, and this is no empty hope for God himself is the one who has prepared us for this wonderful destiny. And to confirm this promise, he gave us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring. This is out of the passion, but I was looking into this and the Greek word where, where it's talking about this here, because this really stuck out to me, uh, when he's talking about he gave the Holy Spirit to us as a pledge, as a promise, the Greek word there is Erebon, and it's the word used in Greek culture for an engagement ring. Like this, this is the Holy Spirit is the down payment. He is the engagement ring to you and I. God's coming back for us. He's coming back for us. The Holy Spirit was the down payment. He was God's engagement ring to us, and he's coming back. That's why we're always full of courage. Even while we're at home in the body, we're homesick to be with the master. For we live by faith and not what we see with our eyes. Somebody say this. I live by faith and not by sight. Say it again. I live by faith and not by sight. And the third time will really help you. I live by faith and not by sight. This is how a born-again believer is supposed to live, by faith, not by what we see. Pastor Jeremy said this. He said, the walk of faith is learning to see what we cannot see. This is the walk of faith. And, you know, there are skeptics, there are unbelievers who you've heard this before, maybe you've done this before, who scoff at this type of thing. You know, they, they, they scoff at the notion because they believe that um, the people who live by faith or claim to live by faith, they aren't grounded in reality. They're, it's like this pie-in-the-sky type of living, ignoring all their problems and just hoping that one day it'll get better. And sure enough, there are probably Christians who are doing that because they have no firm basis in reality. This is reality right here, in reality. But the truth is, and again, another, another quote from Pastor Bill Johnson, he said, people of faith are also realists. They just have their foundation in a superior reality. So don't, don't ever let an argument be used that a person of faith isn't a realist. You're absolutely a realist as a person of faith. You just have your foundation in a superior reality than people who want to claim they're realists and they can only do and see what they, or, and, and believe what they see right in front of them. That's not being real. That's being carnal. If, if I can only believe and act on what I see and what appeals to my senses, that's not called being a realist. That's called being carnal. A carnal person appeals to those things. A spiritual person walks by faith. Walks by faith. So it's just a matter of what reality you want to be a part of. You know, it's kind of, it's a sad deal when we don't, if we don't think there's anything more to this life than what we can see. That's, that's small thinking. It's small thinking and it's sad. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go to what is termed the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. I love this. 
Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So some versions say substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen, right? It's substance. Faith is substance. So how do we hold on to a substance that's the evidence of, of, of things that we can't ascertain with our physical senses, right? And wh- how, how do we do that? Glad you asked. Romans 10, 17. So uh, another cool note I found on my journey today was one that said, hey, Landon, read the Bible like you've never read it before. So I want to encourage you as we're going through these scriptures that you've heard before, let's go through it like you haven't heard these before. So if your faces are like, oh, my gosh, what? (laughs) No way. Wow. I'll get it, okay? That's how we need to approach these, not like, oh, yeah, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. No, guys, listen. What we're talking about, the way, the way to live, like, like Paul was talking about living, the way to live right now where you're at in eternity, uh, for eternity, is what we're talking about right now. Here is how you get it. It comes from hearing, and it comes from hearing the word of God. It comes from hearing the good news about Jesus. This is how faith comes. This is how the very substance comes that you need. It comes from what we're doing tonight. Faith is coming right now. It's coming right now. I want to look at um, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 18 through 20. This is the story of the, the few friends who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus. It says, some men uh, came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Look at these words here. Seeing their faith. Jesus saw their faith. He said, young man, your sins are forgiven. And he, he goes into it with the, with the Pharisees here, tells the young man to get up and walk, and he's healed. He was healed because of his friend's faith. Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. Um, and back in verse 15, I want to take you back. to I, don't, I didn't give you verse 15. That's okay. But So just a few verses ago, before these friends came, I want you to, I want you to see what was going on. In verse 15, it says, but despite Jesus' instructions, he had just healed a leper. He said, go go do the thing you're supposed to do. Go tell the priest and keep this quiet. Um, In verse 15, but despite his instructions, the report of Jesus' power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. This happened, and and guess who heard? Guess who heard the good news about Christ? These friends did. They heard the good news about Christ, and guess what came? Faith came, and they acted on that faith. It was the very substance of what they had been hoping for. The thing that they had been hoping for, they heard about Jesus. They heard about it. This is what they had been hoping for. (coughs) And now they had the evidence of what they haven't seen with their own eyes yet. They had it. So they took that evidence they had, and they found Jesus, and they, they did all they could to get their friend in front of Jesus. And guess what happened? Their faith saw their friend get healed. Yeah, that's what, that's Jesus saw their faith. Is Jesus seeing faith today? Yeah. Is Jesus seeing faith today? This isn't a trick question. When we approach him not with our problems but with his promises, with his word. He sees our faith when we approach him that way. Matthew 15. Are y'all with me? We're not really even going to go much longer. I want to read, I want to read this uh, passage. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. It says, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. 
But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. How many of you read that before and you're like, whoa, Jesus. You would be canceled in 2023. Calling this woman a dog. Like you go back to this culture and Jew, you know what Jews thought of non-Jews? Dogs. That's what Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was called to the Jews, right? She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. You know that this was one of two times in the Gospels that Jesus used the term great faith? Twi- only twice did Jesus say, you have great faith. Neither one of those times was to a Jewish person. They were both to Gentile people. And if you look back through here, look at how she approaches Jesus and what she calls him. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. This is language indicating she says, you're the Messiah. I know who you are, Lord. Jesus didn't respond to her, told her to go away. I was only sent to God's lost sheep. She came and worshipped him again. Look, because she knew who he was, she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, Lord, help me. Jesus responded. uh, Then she replied, that's true, Lord. That's true, Lord. But even the dogs are allowed to eat scraps that fall beneath the master's table. I know who you are. And I'm appealing to who you are. Yeah. And so what faith, what faith did here, this is, this is amazing. What faith did here is something that was not yet available to this woman because she was a Gentile. This would have been like you and I coming to Jesus before he had gone to the cross uh, and died on the cross for the sins of all the world. For anyone who believes on the name of the Lord will be saved. That wasn't now. He was sent to the Jews. He was sent to God's people, the lost sheep of Israel. And so what she did, her faith in him, it, it, her faith in him reached out somewhere into the future and claimed something that she wasn't available to her now, and it brought it back into where she was right now. This is what, this is what her faith did. She approached him based on who he was. Who he was. And and faith went into the future, and her daughter was restored for a promise that was not yet available to her. Are there things, are there things that, that, um, let me say it like this. This is what I wrote down. Faith is believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Faith is believing right now something that can't even make sense unless I were to look at it from the future. Are y'all following me? Faith is believing right now. There is no possible way. I can't see it. I have never heard about it. I can't, I, 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 I've never, except knowing that you're the Messiah, the, what, what, I, what I have heard. I, I know I can't have this yet, uh, but, but faith is, is have to, in advance, believing in advance what you can only see from like back here. Yeah, that makes sense. I know what Jesus did, and Jesus died for all people, and by his stripes you were healed. That, that wasn't yet. It wasn't yet. Yet that's what faith did at that time. Faith, God's word, this, this, this what we have right here, this is the thing that operates outside of this little construct of time that we have right here, this life that we have, and faith is available, and faith is operating. It's an eternal thing. It's an eternal thing. It's eternal. There were, um, uh, I mean, there's different research that, that shows 19, 20, 22, 
Um, but I, so there were 19 individual cases uh, of Jesus healing in the Gospels, and 10 of them specifically referenced the faith of the individual. The faith of the individual involved. Is faith important? Yes. It's important. Does, does my faith or lack thereof matter? Yes. Guys, it's a matter of life and death. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of, it depends on if you want victory in your life or not. Yeah. We know, uh, you get first, put, it up, put up 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4. You see, every child of God overcomes the world, for our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. Yeah. What triumphs over the world? Faith. Our faith does. So does faith, well, if I want to live a victorious life, what must I have? Faith. I, must, I have to have faith. What is the victory that overcomes the world? It's faith. It's faith. And so whatever you, you may have been getting put through it lately, you and your family, your friends, maybe you've experienced this in your past, and, and we're talking about, too, something that may come up in the future, and one of the things that encouraged me uh, that I read today, you might be sitting here tonight thinking that this is cool, you don't really need any of this right now for what's going on in life, but if my mouth will feed my heart the word of faith when I don't need it, then my heart will feed my mouth the word of faith when I do need it. And so what we're doing right now is important for you whether you think it is or not. Because if we're going to feed ourselves the word of faith when we don't think we need it, guess where it's going to be when we do need it? It will be there to draw on that can cross through or out of our mouth, through our lips, and that you get, guess, what? guess what happens then? Faith is released. Faith is released with our words. With our words. And the simplicity of, of faith is simply acting like God is just honest. Like he's just an honest being. Faith is just acting like what God says is true. And what I'm not going to do. And we've all, we've all battled this. All, all of us. I don't even have to ask you. We've all battled this where through my experience through the experience of others in my life I can filter God's words God's word through those experiences and that's not a good place to be that's not something that we want to do um it's a dangerous game to here's what I wrote down it's a dangerous game to filter God's word through our experience or someone else's experience I mean, have you ever read God through, have you ever read God's word through a filter like this? I mean, I have. And that, that's not how it, it's to be read. So when it comes to faith and the things of faith, regardless of what I've experienced, regardless of if there have been times in my life where I believe I was in faith and I come up to a situation and I think I'm in faith and because the situation didn't turn into what God's promise looked like. Now, when I go back and read God's word on this, there, there's something doesn't match up. No, no, no. Let, let God be true, but every man be a liar. And I'm not saying that, oh, well, there's just something, I mean, well, there's just something wrong with us. I mean, if it doesn't work, well, well, here's the deal. We know that it doesn't fall on God. He's perfect, right? He's perfect, and he loves us. And here, here's the thing. When we get God's word, we've got all that we need. That's it. I don't need to filter it through what I've seen happen, through what I haven't seen happen, you know, through the experiences that, that I've had. I take God at his word. And that's what I step out on. Faith doesn't come by hearing Lana's interpretation of God's word. Faith comes when I hear the good news about Christ. That's when faith comes. 
And that's how I'm to get faith, by hearing the good news about Christ. And so that is, that is why it, I don't know how to say it other than how, how important it is for you, for your life, for your spouse, for your kids. I mean, this is something that one of my testimonies, my parents uh, raised me in church. And guess what? They brought me to church when I didn't want to come to church. I didn't have a say whether I went to church or not. Parents, that's okay. It worked out, it worked out okay for me. And, and guess what? Don't base it off of my experience, even though it worked out. But what does God's word say? Do, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as you see the day approaching. So because that's what God's word says, that's what I'm going to do for me. That's what I'm going to do for my family. That's what I'm going to do for my kids. Why? Because God's word says so. Because his word says so. There's safety. There's safety in the flock. There's safety here. All the, the things that I've been through in my life, if it wasn't for the church that God had planted me in and the people that he had connected me to, I would have been a goner. Would have been. Guys, it's, it's life and death stuff. It's life and death for us. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so, you know what people are attracted to? People are attracted to great faith. They're attracted to great faith. And we need to be a people marked by his presence. Absolutely marked by the presence of God. That, that's the difference um, between our God and every other religion. God's people should be marked by his very presence. That's, that's the difference. Faith is huge. And we, we must, we must, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we must fix our gaze on God's word, on what's eternal, on the only thing, the only thing that can help us, that can save us, that can get us from where we're at to where we want to be. It's the only thing that can go into the future and pull a promise back that I have no way how to get on my own, but God's word promises it. It's the only way I can get it from here to there. It's by hearing what he said, believing what he said, and acting like it's true. Acting like it's true. Those four friends, they acted like what they heard was true. They didn't see it firsthand. They just heard. They heard about it. And then they acted on what they heard. And because they acted on what they heard, they saw the end of their faith that day. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Pastor, you got anything? I want to pray over us tonight. You know, sometimes, you know, hearing, hearing God's word, it's amazing and it's all that we need. And, you know, it's like a lot of things in life. It's, it's easy, easier heard, easier said than done, right? But there's grace for you to do what God's word says. There's grace for me to act on what God's word says. I don't have to try to muster it up and to will it to happen on my own and my own power because guess what? I can't. I can't do it. You can't do it. And anytime that God's word comes to us, what, what comes with it is the ability to act on it and to do it. So that's what I want to pray over us tonight because there are things that God wants us to step into that we cannot do apart from faith and who he is and what he said and what he's told us we can have and what he's told us he wants us to do. It requires faith. And it requires us to graduate from this small thinking of where we're at right now to this big eternal thinking right here. This needs to be our thinking. So Father, we just come to you we come to you in Jesus' name, and we just want to say, first of all, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word to us. And we thank you that faith came tonight because we heard the good news about Jesus. 
we heard your word. So Lord, I just thank you uh, for the grace that you've made available to each and every one of us to act on the word that we hear. Lord, help us to remove our, our, our experience, our personal spin on anything. And Lord, let us approach your word um, with clarity and for what it says. Uh, and we're going to approach it like what you say, that's the truth. And that's what we live by. And that's what we act on. Lord, I thank you for grace to be a doer of the word. That's what I declare over everyone in here tonight. We are not hearers only. We are doers of the word of God. We're doers of the word of God. So Lord, I thank you for your help, for the help of the Holy Spirit and for grace to not look at, to not look at our, our short, our, our present troubles that, that are small and that are temporary. But Lord, our purpose, our aim, we are going to fix our eyes and our gaze on your word that is everlasting. It's eternal and it holds the very source of life for us right here and now. That's where we fix our gaze. And no matter where we're at, no matter how deep the pit is, the result will be the same, planted on a firm foundation, pulled out, set on a rock. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's, that's the end result we thank you for it. Father, we love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.